with our technical uh, reminder. So my name is Elissa Kelly. I'm a senior director of alumni relations here at the Yukon Foundation. Uh, thank you so much for spending your evening with us um, in our next installment of the This is America series. Um, this evening, I'm joined by a fabulous panel, um, as well as my colleagues, April Brown and Abigail Jackson. Um, as a reminder, we do have closed captions for our program this evening. Um, you can see the instructions on the screen. If you're having any technical challenges, please feel free to chat us. Uh, Abigail, April, and I will be monitoring that throughout the evening. Um, just another friendly reminder, please put your questions in the Q&A. They get lost in the comments. We'll put some friendly reminders in there, um, but we will have designated time for Q&A at the end of our program. Um, and with that, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our moderator for tonight's program. Uh, Dr. Sandy Grande is a professor of political science and Native American and Indigenous Studies at the University of Connecticut with affiliations in American studies, philosophy, um, race and ethnic and politics programs. Uh, her research and teaching interfaces uh, Native American and Indigenous studies with critical race theory towards the development of more nuanced analyses of these colonial presence. Uh, she was recently awarded the Ford Foundation Senior Fellowship in 2019 and 2020 for a project on Indigenous elders and aging she is a founding member of the New York Stands for Standing Rock, a group of scholars and activists that forwards the aim of the Native American indigenous sovereignty and resurgence. In addition to her academic and organizing work, she has provided elder care for her parents for over 10 years and is the primary caregiver for her father who will celebrate his 94th birthday tomorrow. So congratulations to him. Um, Sandy, we're so proud to have you moderating tonight's discussion. Without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to you to get us started. Thank you so much, Alyssa, and really appreciate the thoughtfulness that went into inviting us and in making this event possible. So thanks so much for that. Um, also, I, I'm getting a couple of texts that some can't get into the webinar, so I don't know if it's possible to re-paste the link in the chat and, or somewhere. Um, I, I don't think they would see it in the chat, but thank you. Um, Ayanchu, Ayanmi, Ayin Punchai, Nyoka Kichwakani, Hartford, Connecticut, Wangang Montikani, Nyoka Sweetie, Sandy Grande. It's lovely to be here. Um, I will, we will begin by acknowledging the land uh, on which we gather, which is the territory of the Mohegan, Mashantucket, Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Skatico, Golden Hill, Pogasset, Nipmuc, and Lenape peoples who have stewarded this land since time immemorial. We acknowledge their efforts and their continued struggles against colonialism and for our collective futures. Um, so just a note that um, land acknowledgements, particularly at land grant institutions have become a part of institutional culture. Um, and this particular acknowledgement was written with the assistance of um, uh, the, of Agamat, of which Chris is a, is a founding founder of. Um, but they're also sort of living documents. So, so you might have noticed that I riffed a little bit off of what we have. Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists from here. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, before we, I introduce the panelists, um, this event, which is This is Native America Land Grant or Land Grab, is part of the This is America series. Um, and it, again, it's just lovely to see this series um, uh, put together by the university. I think particularly in this moment, it's been a really important uh, series for us to participate in. And now I believe I will introduce the panelists. Uh, no, community rules. <laughs> um, because we will be talking about sometimes some challenging things, it's important to be respectful of others' opinions. However, vulgar or counterproductive comments and behavior will not be tolerated. Event managers reserve the right to remove unruly attendees without warning and respectful discourse is highly encouraged. I'm assuming a lot of that activity might happen in the chat. So I actually have that turned off um, and trust our um, very trustworthy monitors to, to handle that should it, should it occur. Um, I also wanna thank our sponsors. Um, this whole series and certainly this event would not be possible without the Yukon alumni, the Yukon School of Social Work, Native American and Cultural Programs, 
the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, the African American Cultural Center, the Asian American Cultural Center, the African American Alumni Council, and the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. So we so appreciate their support. Okay, now to our lovely speakers. Um, it's just an honor and privilege to share this time um, with Chris Newell. He's a, Chris is a multi-award winning museum professional, um, born and raised in Madakmaguk um, territory, which is Indian Township in Maine, and he's a proud citizen of the Passamaquoddy tribe. He also serves as the co-founder and director of education for the Agama Educational Initiative, a majority native owned educational consultancy um, based in Connecticut. He's also a longtime singer. He's been participated and co-created in lots of different documentaries. And most recently, I think the, uh, the author of an amazing children's book. So hopefully he'll tell us something about that and you can all order it. Garrett McComas is also joining us. Garrett's a fellow and project manager for Greenhouse Studios in the Homer Babbage Library at, at UConn. In his role, he works on the facilitation, publication, and preservation of digital humanities projects. And he's interested in the history of classification and information practices. And then we also have Luisa Arieta, who's a doctoral student in the history department at the University of Connecticut. She's also a research fellow for Greenhouse Studios. Her research focuses on national museums as stages for the performative embodiment of the state and as tools for the construction of national identities um, in Greenhouse Studios. For those of you that are familiar with the Land Grab CT project that they've um, helped put together um, is responsible for a lot of the, the graphics um, and presentation and research behind that project. So thank you for that. So we're gonna just jump right in. Garrett, I think I might turn to you first and we'll start with, if I was teaching right now, I'd say we're gonna start with the what. So to just provide some foundational information for those that might be with us tonight on what does it mean to be a land grant university? What is a land grant specifically, um, um, you know, the Morrill Act, or which is actually a, a number of different acts um, that granted uh, land to lots of different states um, for the development of universities and higher education. So um, maybe you can get us started, Garrett. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, if you could just bring up the slide and we can talk for a couple of minutes, just kind of uh, just give like a short rundown of kind of what the Morrow Act is, uh, some of the historical conditions kind of that it was passed under, and then uh, how you kind of is tied to, to the Morrow Act and, and uh, what the implications of that are. Um, so the first Morrow Act was passed in 1862, um, and it was specifically uh, created or passed to create colleges that um, teach branches of learning related to agricultural and the mechanical arts. Uh, and then in, basically to do this in order to promote uh, liberal and professional education of industrial classes um, and kind of rather specifically to sort of in, uh, boost economic production. So in, um, in Morrill's original vision, um, it was really, really wasn't created. Uh, th these institutions really weren't created to uh, train workers, but really to educate graduates um, that were to guide and to lead industrial forces of what he called a great nation. Um, so it's also important to recognize that this was passed in the same year as the Pacific Railroad Act, as well as the Homestead Act. Um, all three of these acts were these sort of effectively these massive wealth transfers to white citizens that uh, were made possible by com commodifying land that had recently been taken by the US government. Um, and I say recent, meaning uh, some of these, some of the lands were taken or the, the official treaties were signed in like 1948. So about 14 years before a lot of these acts were passed. Um, so this land was acquired by the violent and systematic dispossession of indigenous people through uh, around 162 treaties. Um, and through the original Morrow Act of 1862, 10.7 uh, million acres were granted. Um, and basically how this worked was that each state got 30,000 acres per representative. So kind of each state got a number of, of acres depending on how many or how many people they had or what the population has because the representatives were based on population. Um, and so the land that was granted to each state was taken either from within their borders. Uh, this happened in, in uh, states that were sort of like Western states like California or Oregon or Washington. 
or um, the state was given scripts. Um, what the, the scripts were basically vouchers uh, for unclaimed federal lands uh, that could be sold and then sort of put into a fund. Um, so the state of Connecticut through this act received scripts for 178,190 acres of land. Um, through the sale of these, of these scripts, they raised $135,000. And kind of how this works is that the state then put this money into an account and then yearly interest payments are paid to the university. Um, so originally it was around $3,000. This is in, in perpetuity. So the university receives $3,000 every year from this account. Um, it might not seem like a lot now, but it was a lot then and it really helped UConn um, sort of gain its footing financially. It wasn't really financially viable before this. Um, and it also kind of in addition to this, there's a, a second moral act that was passed that had additional money. Um, and in addition to this, things like the Hatch Act and a number of other different acts that um, kind of raise money for, for land grant institutions. Um, so uh, yeah, so UConn has been receiving money since 1893. And before this, uh, Yale's the, the land grant institution in Connecticut. Um, it kind of, this kind of came about after a long legal battle, but um, basically through the Morrow Act, uh, UConn is also tied to land from 12 current day states. So I, I won't go through all of them, but you can see them sort of in the second portion there. So anywhere from Florida to California, kind of anything in between. Um, and in addition to this, uh, around 30 sort of broad territories of indigenous people um, and many more sort of uh, individual tribes. Um, so kind of in addition to the, to the ones that Sandy have already read out, there's, there's many more peoples that are, are tied to the university through the Moral Act. Thanks so much for that rundown, um, Garrett. Luisa, I know you also worked on the history and some of this research. I'm just wondering if there's anything you might wanna add to just our, our basic or foundational understanding of what, is, what we're talking about in terms of, of land and why the question of even land grab versus land grant um, is raised. Um, I think Garrett made a really good explanation. I would just like to expand on the fact um, that there was like a comprehensive federal policy. So it happened in 1862. And if we remember, we are in, uh, United States was in the middle of the Civil War over the abolition of slavery, right? So as you're fighting for freedom for African Americans, apparently they are they take the uh, advantage that Democrats are not attending Congress because they want to separate from the United States and the Republicans pass these three acts. That is like the first time that the United States comprehensively says, this is what we're going to do with these lands in three separate ways. So I think it's really important to understand the contradictions within the creation of the America, the United States nation, right? As you are so apparently granting rights to African-Americans, you are pushing Native Americans away, you are taking away their lands and their right to be citizens, right? Because in that moment, having land and exploiting your own land, which is what was uh, done through the Homestead Act, was the equivalent to be a useful, rightful citizen. So you're taking the land away from Native, Amer Native Americans is basically saying, you don't have that right, you are not like us. So I think that's one of the big implications that we have to look through, through this land. Furthermore, I think like as Garrett said, $3,000 seems like little, but we have to look not only at the money that the university made, but the money that people who bought these lands got uh, from it. So you look at what we call generational wealth. Um, and it's like the fact that these lands were passing from family to family, they were used, for example, for mining because they had a lot of natural resources uh, to a point that is impossible to quantify the amount of money that these lands have produced, not only for the university, but also for wife generational wealth. So when you look really looking at talking about money, you're like, you cannot really do it. And uh, recently we also try, if you go to the website, we try to show what these scripts of land look like today. Um, a Walmart is in some of them, uh, uh, a studio, our studios and one particular in Napa Valley. It's a house that was just sold for $3 million. Uh, so we can see that this is real, it became real estate that is actually generating money, but not for Native Americans. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the value of that land, I imagine, is just immeasurable. I mean, we're talking 10.7 million acres, which is hard to even fathom. It, my guess is that would be roughly between like the, the size of Connecticut and Massachusetts combined. Um, so, 
thank you for, for helping us with the what, and then we're gonna turn a bit to, again, if I was teaching, I would say the so what. You went a little bit in that direction already, but what's the implications of this history uh, in general for the university in particular? Um, you know, currently there's roughly um, less than 1.1% 1. Um, 1 of UConn students identify as Native American or Indigenous. I think it's 0.1% actually, just the lowest proportion of any other group at the university. Um, I don't believe I could be wrong. Um, I don't know that there are folks on staff. And there might be at, at different campuses, not at stores, I don't believe. Um, and I think we have, as of just last year, um, two full-time tenure track faculty that identify as Native American or Indigenous. So that's part of the so what. But um, Chris, I'm wondering if you can jump in here um, to get us started on thinking about what are the implications of this history? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so when I think about the history, um, it, it's really, uh, at the time especially, we're talking the uh, 19th century westward expansion. Um, and one of the things that happens oftentimes in American history books is that they will talk about that expansion as if it was gradual. Um, it's only Americans that actually use that term uh, to talk about 19th century American westward expansion. If you talk to anybody from uh, other parts of the world, they will tell you the truth that it's actually the fastest expansion of a population over a geographic area ever in the history of the world. Um, so if you think about what's going on at the time, there's a lot of land that, uh, you know, has uh, been designated as uh, the rights of America to, uh, you know, to negotiate for uh, from Native people. And a lot of this is being taken, you know, away very actively at this time, you know, through uh, sessions, often through treaty. I tell people that the United States was not created by domination. It was created by the signing, uh, or it wasn't created by conquest. It was created by the signing of, of paper documents. Um, but it was very much violent back concessions. And those concessions uh, of land happened in my territory as well, you know, with the, the Treaty of uh, uh, Waterford from uh, 1794, uh, which gave the rights of settlers to come into the state of what, what eventually became the state of Maine. Um, and we were supposed to share the land and always, you know, Wabanaki people have uh, hunting and fishing rights forever, yet the state of Maine established and people began to privately own land. Um, and it created a school, University of Maine, as one of these land grant institutions for the purpose of teaching things like forestry. So, uh, you know, to get more people, uh, non-Native people, to come and live and, and stake out private pieces of land, what was essentially Wabanaki land, and, uh, you know, our acreage, you know, even though we uh, had reserve lands in that treaty, even that acreage of 25,000 acres or so was encroached upon, you know, quite a bit, uh, even several islands that uh, were given to us in specific names, just all they did was change the names, you know, so if you, you think about the implications of the land grant status of not just the universities, but just how land was taken from indigenous people, we still live with this legacy today. Um, and it wasn't, didn't start to reverse itself really until my tribe, the Passamaquoddy tribe, uh, with the Land Claim Settlement Act and the, Pas uh, the Penobscot tribe um, uh, uh, with the um, Maine Indian Land Claim Settlement Act, which was for 12 and a half million acres, um, for a while, actually, we held that land kind of sort of in title uh, because um, there was an illegal transference of land that happened. So we still live with this legacy today. And our communities are oftentimes uh, separated, you know, from the promise of an institution like a, a public institution. And that's, that's really true of, of uh, my particular territory as well. And so we do not benefit um, you know, from this system that was created for the purpose of literally getting more people, non-Native people in to occupy our homelands. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Chris. It's uh, just to underscore a couple of things. You, you've said a lot, shared a lot of wisdom with us, but, um, you know, I think one thing that sticks out to me is this notion of a grant or even a transfer. You know, grants are that sounds like a good thing to get. <laughs> it's um, it, and often not associated with violent, violent dispossession. And so I think even that shift from grant to grab, at least raising that question, you're like, well, what do you mean a land grab? You know, I thought we got it fair and square. Um, so, so I like the way in which it's framed in that sense. Um, and then there's also a history of folks 
don't know, particularly of the first institutions of higher education, primarily the Ivy Leagues, but in addition to like the outright, you know, dispossession of lands, um, there was also, also a way to kind of procure land and funding to build Indian colleges or with a promise of civilizing. So there's this whole civilizing project um, with the, that began with the view of native peoples as less than human, as savage. Um, and so institutions were gonna solve, at some point, just outright genocide and dispossession yeah. becomes costly, either financially or costly um, to a nation that's trying to establish itself as a democracy, right? Yeah. So, so it's like, okay, we're gonna civilize the Indians um, and get money to build Indian colleges or to educate to promise um, many charters for to start even institutions um, wouldn't have been passed unless they with, without a promise of civilizing or educating Indians. Um, and then many of them uh, reneged on that promise. For better or for worse, I think is debatable, but um, the funding they got to build aspects of institutions never benefited uh, Native students um, in, in any way, really. Um, Garrett or Luis, I don't know if you want to jump in here in the, in um, the so what or the current implications. Go ahead. Uh, sure, like just expanding on, on what you're touching upon, the, the, the education part. And we try to show that pro with the project. Now this goes into to show how these institutions are created. There's pretty much a colonial settler mindset behind them that we need to, to acknowledge. Hence the change from grant to grab. Uh, but also there is the fact of what was happening to these communities in terms of education. And education of Native Americans had started prior, like uh, since the first missions. But then we have, when this, you start creating the, the boarding schools, the first one, the Carlisle Industrial School, that you see this idea of literally, and they, they literally say, we are going to kill the Indian, save the man. Because what we need, we're going to strip them of all the cultural uh, contents or all their connections with their families. We are going to change the relationship with their land. Not to say that they, they achieve it. Clearly they didn't, but this was the, the idea behind it. And so there is a dispossession that is happening simultaneously in terms of land, but in terms of your cultural heritage as well, that is trying to strike. And as you mentioned as well, like it was all this money from the scripts, from these lands, the Morrill Act, is all destined to why higher education, to higher education institutions serving white people. Like only until the second moral act is that some black colleges received some money and Native American colleges did not receive one cent out of it until 1994. Like almost a whole century, more than one century after these lands have been taken from there. Um, but I think there is also the issue that that is presented now with the land grab project that is not only that this money hasn't served their education, it's also like now that their money is given back to them to some of these schools, there is not much Native American content in the, there is nothing on impact in Native American content impacting higher education. Like if there's still this mentality of industrial or classical arts, there is not a concern for actually including Native American perspectives of the world and teachings into professional areas that, that are thought by university. Thank you for that. Yeah, you know, um, certainly the, the, ben the long history of denial of, of, of access and benefits is something um, we can continue to think around. I, we probably should say though, also and mention that, that the Merrill Act becomes a proud part of the history of land grant institutions because it did expand access beyond sort of the landed gentry and the elites, right? So it was a moment in which um, working class whites, middle class whites could now have access to higher education. And to a large degree, that's the history of the nation is, you know, this uh, tension between an extension of benefits that then happens on the backs of others, sometimes quite violently. And so it, it gets complicated to reconcile. Um, Garrett, sometimes not so complicated, but sometimes complicated, Garrett. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking about kind, kind of about 
couple of things that, that people brought up, but just this idea of, um, I guess like what the education is for and like what it, what it, what education from Wayne Grant institutions does. Cause um, oftentimes it's just this uh, sort of, they teach people how to extract wealth from land. So it's, it's a certain relationship to land. So it's kind of going a little bit off some, some of the stuff that Lisa was saying, just kind of like different differences in epistemology and kind of what, what your relationship should be to the land. But um, I think, it, yeah, I think it's definitely important to, to note that, that um, these institutions also were teaching people to, to extract resources. And it kind of, I also think of the university itself as oftentimes kind of falling into this same logic of colonialism where um, it's interested in sort of land and wealth accumulation. So um, it's, it, which, which isn't necessarily like a bad thing in itself, I guess, but it's, it's often done sort of uh, undemocratically. So specifically I'm thinking of Yukon, um, the way that it, it acquires land in the nineties, it was kind of, it, the state exempted it from uh, acquiring land in, in the same way that other state agencies have to acquire land. So it doesn't have to go through the same sort of processes that other, um, that other state agencies do, do. So they're kind of able to just buy up land and use it as they see fit. And it's, um, it's not done in really a democratic fashion. I mean, just over the last summer in 2021, um, there, there's the dispute with Mansfield over some land. And this has kind of happened um, a number of times throughout the university's history where they have, they have disputes with either the people around them or the city around them or something like that. And usually the you know, university is able to sort of get their way in that situation because, because of the state backing, because of the sort of massive amount of wealth they have. So I, I just think that in general, we're kind of talking about um, how land is kind of used and controlled and, and when land is being used in ways that are undemocratic, um, I think that that's something that um, specifically with land grant institutions, we kind of have to think about because they're oftentimes kind of like the, the boilerplate description of land grant institutions is this idea of, of democracy and this idea of um, bringing sort of like greater education to the most number of citizens, but you really have to kind of be thoughtful about what that education is and kind of what a relationship to the land is too, I think. Thank you, Garrett. I really appreciate that insight. And it takes us into a bit of a different direction in which people often focus on just the transfer, the material transfer of land from some peoples to another's. Um, and maybe the, the you know, financial or economic implications of that. Um, and even trying to put a dollar on it, as Louisa said. But maybe, you know, it's certainly equally, if not more, um, you know, violent is the displacement of a, you know, one worldview over another and the ways in which land is perceived. In one, you know, property was so central um, to the formation of the nation state or the settler state to the extent that um, unless you owned individual property, there wasn't a perception of them, of you as human, as civilized, certainly not as civilized. If you were civilized, then you understood the value and importance and being human was also almost synonymous with owning individual property, private property. Um, and certainly with regard to, to um, um, uh, enslaved blacks, they were property. So, so, you know, even a very different relationship to property, they were perceived as property, traded as commodities and property um, as a way in, in the kind of, uh, as integral to state formation. And so we also live with that legacy, right? A kind of a logic that you talked about in terms of um, extraction um, or just creates a whole different kind of relationship to land as either commodity, even if it's to care for land, even if you're even if you're talking about producing like environmentally or sustainable kind of ethic toward land, it's still like you can't care for even the the relation of care often creates a kind of hierarchy um, or something that you you know own but still are responsible for, um, as opposed to a, a relationship to man as your kin, as your relation, as a relative. Um, as something that teaches you how to be human. Um, and Chris, I don't know if you wanna jump in here um, and either talk from, yeah, what, what comes to mind when you, when you think about indigenous relations to land. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, being from one of the Northeastern tribes, many of our tribes have, um, you know, a, a, a maternal viewpoint 
of, of landscape um, in that uh, it provides life. Uh, and we as human beings, um, you know, have a duty uh, to take care of it, you know, and, and, and to sustain it. Uh, and in, in return, it'll give us everything, you know, that we need. Um, that's the life way that existed prior to the English language becoming the dominant language here in this country. And that's one of the things I try to normalize with our work at Agamal Educational Initiative is that English is a foreign language to this land. It contains the worldview of England. And in the English language, you can own land, you can even own people. Um, in Algonquin dialects, we do not have those types of concepts within the language itself. Uh, our, our descriptions of, of uh, people are oftentimes relational to either to, to each other or to the land itself. Uh, Pasquamaquati is the anglicized version of Beskudamukadi, which means the people who spear Pollock. That refers to our seasonal gathering at the mouth of Skudig, which is now the U.S. Canadian border, um, uh, known as the St. Croix River, uh, for the sea run Pollock, uh, you know, uh, uh, harvest every year, uh, you know, during the summer. And that food supply would sustain us throughout the entire year. So our relation to land and water, not just not just land, but also water life. Right, this maternal force that's giving us life um, just defines who we are and also created our languages. Um, you know, and when I tell people is, uh, you know, America has been around for, you know, just in a couple of hundred years, um, it is not existing in a sustainable fashion. My ancestors lived here for well over 12,000 years and did so in a sustainable fashion. And if America wants to learn about sustainability, it really needs to unlearn the English language and start to learn worldviews of Algonquin or, uh, you know, other native languages in their own geographies to find out, you know, the actual uh, owner's manual for sustainability uh, in connection to the land. Um, because uh, the truth is, regardless of history, we are all here now. We are all responsible to steward this land together if we're going to exist for our children and for our children's children and going forward with the next generations. And so we all have a collective responsibility to this land. Um, and it's something that we, you know, we need to uh, once again, just kind of adopt uh, less English worldview and more uh, native worldviews through our, our own languages. Thanks for that, Chris. Uh, yeah, certainly in this moment when we're all just trying to survive global pandemics, <laughs> cataclysmic environmental disasters everywhere, um, you hope that it sort of questions, you know, in a real deep and fundamental way, how we're living on this earth. And it doesn't seem, I agree with you, it does not seem sustainable at all. Um, in, in the, you know, from the indigenous, I guess, perspective, um, you know, yeah, most of our languages, um, come from and through our relationships to land, whatever the, you know, um, flora, fauna, whatever life is in one's location, um, geographic location, teaches us how to be human, right? How to live there. Um, and so we have to remain in close relations to that and pass it on gener generationally so every generation understands how to live um, and how to be human and how to be care how to be human is through your relations, right? Through your kin. And yeah, so most absolutely. of our- Absolutely, I mean, even, yeah. even a larger view of, uh, you know, Pasquamaquati people are part of a larger group of tribes called Wabanaki, which is the anglicized version of what's my language, Chikwabanakig, or people from, um, you know, the people from the Donland. Uh, you know, it, our ancestors well knew well our uh, place in the geography of Turtle Island. They knew that we were located in the place where the sun first hits this continent and actually we're given a purpose through our own cosmology that we are to welcome the day uh, and sing the sunrise up every morning so the rest of the country can have sun. So we do have a purpose and it is all tied, you know, definitely to, to land and nature and, and all of these forces of life. Awesome, thanks for sharing that. And so like the question is not just about um, what the land grab or land theft, um, what the violence that it enacted on indigenous peoples, I mean, that's certainly a primary concern, um, but what that robbed or thieved from all of us, um, that knowledge, um, the fact that we don't know what, most of us don't know the indigenous language associated with the territory of what is now um, stores. Um, but let's move maybe in a, in a, another direction to the, like, so we did the what and the so what, and it's maybe it's the now what. Um, but what are there, you know, 
uh, do you have, I mean, the land grant, the land grab CT project is a way of kind of initiating a project of acknowledgement of the university of this history um, of rejecting, you know, to some degree, some of the colonial logics and tendencies. Um, but where do you see opportunities for the university to continue that acknowledgement, that reckoning? Where can we do more? Um, well, this was a part of the project, like the way the project started was because uh, Sage Phillips with the Native American Students Association and Glenn Mitoma with Dot Impact, they applied to a grant um, to actually try to talk, do research about these issues, um, specifically concerning the fact that there is so low the population of Native American students at the University of Connecticut, especially if you compare it to the University of Maine, for example. So speaking here, based on what Sage had said and as a group, uh, there is definitely the issue of getting the university as an institution to recognize this violence to recognize this, uh, this past and actually Sage and Garrett had been working on updating the land acknowledgement to reflect that there's not only lands within the state of Connecticut that were appropriated, that were taken away by the university, but actually lands in Michigan, in California, Arkansas, as Garrett said. So there is that depth to recognize those Native American communities as well. In the long term, our ideal situation, <laughs> it's like, like the as Native uh, Sage Phillips as the outgoing Native Americans Association president had in mind is start talking about reparations, right? What can the university do, for example, to offer maybe free tuition to Native American students, not only those based on Connecticut, but across those states that in, is in depth, that it has a depth, a moral depth, right? Uh, so, uh, but also, and that was something that we kind of try to reflect in the in the website as well. Um, as you can see, we don't have many pictures because we couldn't get pictures like, hey, we don't want to show the view of the colonizer. We want to show the view Native American. So what we tried to do was try to rescue the language as well, and how these lands were called, um, and the people who inhabited it there. So um, a, as you well know, just recently the the Native American curriculum was, was deemed oblig a mandatory for, for schools in Connecticut. So our hope is that maybe we can work hand in hand with them to actually include these topics within uh, and these languages and these customs within what is uh, learned in schools as well. So, so we are not constantly celebrating things that, like the Memorial Act but actually looking at it with a more critical and complex uh, way, like how do we relate to each other? Yes, this benefited me as a, imagine I'm white, as a white male, but in the hands of, in the backs of which was it built. And I think in that, just because I wanted to mention this before, uh, if, you, if you compare the median income of, a, of the students coming to Yukon, it's not low. <laughs> It is not low as you compare it, for example, university in Texas, El Paso, that the median income of the household of the student that comes is $25,000 per year. So what we look at here is like the university serves a kind of middle-class population that are kind of well off. Uh, so in that sense, it's like, yeah, it helped create middle-class, but like, who is actually helping today? It's certainly not Native American students. I'm gonna pass to you, Chris, both as an alum and somebody who's working um, somewhat on the curricular uh, initiative at the state. Um, if you want it, whatever you want to share about your experiences. Um, yeah, I, I mean, um, what can you know the university do? Well, you know, there's some things that are starting to happen, and I'll just kind of reflect a little bit back to my experience at UConn. Uh, I originally was an undergrad at Dartmouth College, so I mean, my whole undergrad experience has been at schools uh, that have a land grant status of some sort, or were created to, you know, uh, uh, you know, supposedly um, uh, teach Native Americans, but did a very, very horrible job at that for such a long time. Um, you know, and when I uh, one of the things that happened is when I decided to uh, pick back up my my undergrad education, I went to community college here in Connecticut first. Um, you know, with the idea of taking advantage of the state law that uh, community college grads in state 
automatically get admission into UConn because I really, really, uh, you know, admired, uh, you know, uh, as UConn as a public institution. And one of the things that really attracted me to it, uh, because of my previous experience at Dartmouth, I started as an engineering student, I left there as a Native American studies major, um, was uh, the fact that there was a Native American studies minor that was offered on the books at UConn um, back in, in uh, um, 2011. Yet when I enrolled at the Storrs campus, I, I found out, uh, you know, much uh, to my disappointment that none of the classes on the Storrs campus were being offered. Um, so what I ended up having to do as a result was use the satellite campuses, Storrs, uh, not Storrs, uh, Avery Point and uh, Hartford, uh, where classes were offered, but there was never a, a, an ability for me to complete the minor because of uh, certain classes were just not offered anywhere within the Yukon system. Um, so for me as a native student, um, you know, that, that really kind of uh, uh, made the experience for me a very lonely one, um, which is one of the reasons why I'm so active. I graduated in 2014 uh, with, uh, from the, the uh, Center for Continuing Studies with a BGS degree. And I've been active working with uh, the you know, former Dodd Research Center, Human Rights Center, uh, Glenn Matoma, um, the New York School of Education, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion um, with ways of of trying to incorporate and bring in more native students, but how do we do that? You know, laying the groundwork for bringing more native students onto the Yukon campus. Um, because, uh, you know, college experience for a native student, especially for someone like me that grew up in a very isolated, uh, you know, uh, reservation where the culture is completely different than, than uh, American culture. Um, it is a, a, a bit of a shock uh, when you end up in the colonial university system. And so therefore there needs to be community, but there also needs to be support at the university level that recognizes that. And none of those things existed. And so I, I, um, the reason I succeeded was likely because I had been through this before and dropped out at Dartmouth where those things were not available there, even with a large native student population. Um, you know, but when I, uh, at UConn, I was much older and I guess a better to weather the storm, but it was still affected uh, my experience on campus. And that's uh, one of the things I'm hoping uh, to see change. And I'm starting to see change Thankfully, uh, you know, the work of the students, uh, Harmony uh, and Sage and others, uh, so many I could name, uh, you know, have just been doing amazing things. And then we get to see you uh, now here on the UConn campus, uh, Dr. Grande. So uh, that's another uh, huge improvement in my book. Thanks for that, Chris. Um, wouldn't be here without you, I don't think. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, things I think are you know, starting to happen and starting to shift. Thankfully, it's, you know, 2022. So I think we're well past time, but, but better late than never. Um, but if you can think, you know, Sage wasn't able to be here. But when you think about Native students still being 0.01% of the student body, like the weight of that that is often placed on their shoulders or that they, you know, feel um, feel committed to undertake, you know, all of them have been, it's just been a Herculean effort I think to get things where they are. Um, you know, the Native American cultural program is still, I think the only group that's not formally recognized as a student group, they're working on that now. It's the only student uh, sort of non-student student group um, without a full-time advisor, staffed advisor. Um, that's something they're hoping to shift. Um, they're trying to get a signage project going, which is like um, literally, you know, signs in in Mohegan and Pequot language around campuses which other campuses have done to sort of mark um, uh, and make it more explicit that we're on indigenous land. Um, there's a lot of support for that at the student level. I think, I don't know if they're hitting roadblocks at the upper admin level, but it so far um, hasn't happened. Um, and again, um, with regard to the curriculum, I think uh, I might be wrong. I would love to be wrong if, if you know, but I might be the first um, full-time tenure track indigenous faculty member to teach an indigenous studies course on the stores campus. Um, so, so, I mean, on the other hand, I think the, um, the College of Agriculture and Health and Natural Resources is making some big moves. They started a scholarship program, which I think is really interesting and appropriate that I think again, one of the, I'm new, so I don't know all the history, but um, it's interesting to see that one of the first initiatives of this kind where they're granting full scholarships to um, cohorts of, of students beginning uh, in the fall of this year um, that will be recruited from nations, tribal nations across Southern New, Southern New England um, is happening in the, in the ag school. Um, 
so there's there's sort of a bit of a poetic uh, justice there that's uh, that's nice to see. Um, I don't know if this is the moment in which I think we want to turn to some questions um, from the audience or Garrett, I don't know, sorry, if you wanted to jump in here about your call to action, if there's something you wanted to put out there. Uh, <laughs> well, no, I think, I think, I think no, y'all said Garrett, it all very yeah. well, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't, I don't have I to say something. Okay, sure, Luisa. Um, just uh, building upon something that Chris said, like um, it's amazing that the College of Agriculture is trying to recruit native students, but then you encounter the issue that there are no resources for them in campus. And that's where the work of Sage and other comes into place, right? I remember her telling, like, we wanted to have an office, and they could they tell we couldn't have a better office. It was literally a broom closet because we didn't have enough students. But if we don't have an association, we cannot invite the students, right? So one of the things that we were discussing in like the presentation of this project to the School of Social Work. It's um, the idea that it needs to be like, we have to be prepared to bring these people over. No, it's not simply like design the problems, like, hey, it is the money. It's just like, as Chris said, the psychological impact of being in a colonial campus like that or and taking advantage of the, the same system that is intent, intended to destroy your community, right? So um, I think that there's definitely the possibility for, for trying to provide those resources um, of course, sometimes the university can be, the departments can be quite isolated. Um, the School of Social Work might not really mental health services, but that's one of the things that we need to think about for these mm -hmm. students. Yeah, I mean, I think I would love to see more structural support so they would, don't wind up there, more pro proactive faculty and staff. And it's possible. I think University of Arizona just announced that it, they have 60 plus faculty there now. And they were really careful to say, under the leadership of, of, of Dr. Brian Bayboy, among others, um, but they were really careful to say, it's not because we're in the Southwest, because there's lots of colleges and universities in the Southwest that don't have 60 plus faculty members. So it takes commitment, it takes leadership, it takes belief in this project. Um, and it, and you know, it's, not, it's not super easy to be among the only as a faculty member either. Um, all right, so now I think we will turn, I don't know, uh, Alyssa, if you're gonna, um, read the questions out or if you. Sure, I can read the questions. Um, so the first one, uh, is there a conversation on land grant language grant specifically being euphemistic in the way it centers passing of land to university founders, not the indigenous people who lived with and stewarded the land? I'm not quite sure what that's asking, but I think we did talk a little bit about that notion of of grant and what it what it kind of um, elides, which it wasn't it wasn't it was a grant they granted to themselves. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to. Uh, um, I'll, I'll just jump in once again. Uh, okay. This my talk about the English language. Um, you know, something like the, the way we talk about history, right, um, you know, um, uh, the Louisiana Purchase, um, there, there's a great example right there, 1803, um, we purchase from France land that they don't occupy, um, <laughs> uh, you know, what, what that purchase was, was really the purchase from France for the rights of America to negotiate in the Missouri River Basin with the tribes that live there. Um, so there was no purchase of land that happened, you know, and America didn't expand it just on on the maps that they were creating for themselves they did. Um, but you know, it, is it really a purchase right so there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, labels that the English language puts on our history that are oftentimes problematic. Um, and so sometimes, yeah, I, I, and this is what, what this conversation is really about, right? You know, land grant versus land grab, you know, uh, whose perspective, um, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, are, are we starting to see? And, and there are always alternate perspectives. And from an indigenous perspective, you know, definitely, you know, you can feel the land grab side, uh, you know, when you think about the history of, of uh, you know, the uh, loss of land, rapid dispossession, uh, not just in New England, but across the country, especially during this time period here. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's an exercise in the English language right there. Uh, there's a lot of words, the words like frontier and pioneer, uh, when we talk about the story of American westward expansion, disregards that there are native people, right, that are on the other side of that line. So what, what is it the front of, you know, it's the middle of, it, it, you know, it's, there's a lot of things that we could talk about definitely when uh, we're discussing these terms. Mm -hmm. We should be critical too, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. It's like what we attest to is a sanitation of history. <clears throat> I could definitely put the words that don't carry such an extreme meaning. And you put it out there and it looks pretty and nobody's gonna criticize it more. And that is one of the issues that we have now, all this fight over critical race theory. Now they think it, it's everyone is exploding because it's literally asking, what does this really mean for the people who were involved? What, what actually happened there? Uh, so I think like definitely, and the ones who started the, the shift towards this was the original website. I, I think they were not so explicit in their conversation. They were more like in their name, in the naming of the project, Tristan Adon um, and others in Robin Lee in actually attempting to like, hey, this is not land grant. This is not being given. This is taken. These universities know what was happening. This was done with a purpose. Thank you for that. Um, I found the chat, Alyssa, if you want me to try to navigate. I, either way is fine with me. Um, I'm happy to ask. Uh, a couple of people sent me questions directly, so okay. maybe I'll ask oh, some great. of those. Sure. Um, so uh, this one, somewhat provocative, but I'm very interested to hear what the panelists have to say. Um, are you concerned with the Supreme Court agreeing to review cases challenging the use of race in admissions? Yeah, that is a, that, I mean, of course, you know, absolutely the, the legacy of colonialism is imbricated with the legacy of, of racism, of white supremacy and of anti-black racism and specifically. Um, so, so I think we all, uh, those of us that have been um, dispossessed or oppressed or um, have complicated relations to the nation state, I think it makes sense to be in solidarity and be in support um, <clears throat> it might be too complicated to, to, to dive into too much, but the, the policy itself, um, you know, I would say Native peoples have a, a bit more complicated uh, relationship to the policy of affirmative action, particularly if they're citizens of their own sovereign nations. Again, rights tend to come through just a different avenue of treaties as opposed to, you know, or not opposed to, but in addition to rights discourses. Um, and the tension between that, um, and, Hopefully, I'll, I'll be able to explain this sort of somewhat in simple terms. Um, but because rights discourses are so central to the US, let's start this way. When we think about freedom and liberation, we, also, we often talk in the discourse of rights. Who's denied rights? Who has rights? Where there's more rights? There's a benefit of rights. Um, and, and in particular, civil rights. And those civil rights come, um, you have access to them through, through through yourself as a citizen of the nation, right? Through citizenship. Um, and just like it was land theft and not, you know, land grant, I think citizenship is something that was imposed upon indigenous peoples um, of what is now the US. Most people were not, most were not interested, although at the time that it happened, it was sort of the only avenue to, to not being completely um, disappeared. So, um, you know, so it's also some, uh, somewhat of a bit of a ransom, even like you, you know, accept your individual, your citizenship into the nation as a way of eroding your indigenous sovereignty of your prior citizenry to your own nation. Um, so it's complicated because we're often left with this again, when we think we're, we're being, um, um, trying to be progressive and, and supportive, we often turn to the discourses of rights or inclusion or access all things that really land differently for indigenous peoples of this land. So, um, but I think it's very concerning. It's very concerning giving the history of the nation. It's concerning um, as part of a, just a longer, 
you know, deray of erosion and tension and fear, you know, now there's uh, all kinds of bills and legislations about what teachers can teach and how and what students can learn and that are so, you know, out there. Um, it's concerning. I, I mean, I would say I'm, I'm personally very concerned about it. I don't know who else wants to weigh in here. I'll jump in really quickly. Um, you know, it, it's it's absolutely a concern. Uh, you know, because the, the the history that caused you know uh, laws like affirmative action to be passed are, are not you know that old. <laughs> you know, um, and and the effects of them have you know uh, we haven't like flipped over the script over you know entirely from uh, from those days and. Um, uh, and just making it more effective, but also there's this another idea that uh, you know worries me about it. Um, in that uh, Indian, uh, the word Indian is actually a legal political status uh, within this country. It's not a racialized status. Na Americans tend to racialize Native peoples, but we actually have a, um, a legal status, a political status within this country, and our uh, our governments have a state-to-state -state relationship. Um, you know, so uh, you know when you're talking about trying to level the playing field uh, and undo the effects of colonization, you've got to be real. Uh, about the fact that, uh, you know, especially land grant institutions were created for uh, creating land owners. And the first voters, you know, were, it's not, not, not an excuse that uh, they were only white male Christian land owners in this country. Not everybody had the right to vote when America was formed. Um, it was only land owners that had that right. And so this idea of land ownership is kind of driven into us, driven into us, that that is what makes us successful. And that's what a citizenship with the 1924 Citizenship Act was all about, was trying and to entice Native people to become landowners and to take over this idea of America and commodifying and all of these types of things. Um, and, uh, you know, so, yeah, uh, I, it, um, it, it becomes rather um, uh, frustrating for me, uh, you know, when I do see efforts, um, uh, you know, going against um, the obvious that we see in, in, in our normal everyday lives. Um, you know, it's just uh, you've got to uh, kind of diversify your mind and, 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 and be out there and talk to different groups of people and see how America affects them um, to understand, you know, what are the answers for, for, uh, uh, for uh, undoing these types of uh, um, inequities that we have in our society. Recognize them, admit them, um, and then let's start thinking together on what we can do, but, uh, you know, attacking uh, solutions um, you know, with, without a viable, better solution um, doesn't, doesn't work for us, uh, you know, and, it, and it's been the way of this country, uh, you know, for such a long time. And it's really, we've got to do better as human beings. We really do. Thanks for that, Chris. And I believe, I don't know, there's a, behind it, there's often this fear of, of being taken over. But I believe, again, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I think if we're talking four-year institutions, um, we're still talking upwards of 70%, maybe 72% of, of, of undergraduates at four-year institutions are, are identify as white. So, you know, and that's cobbling everybody else together. <laughs> um, so, so not disentangling, you know, black students from native students, from Latinx students, et cetera. for our next question. Um, uh, one great question we got is uh, asking, what would you say are the top three things that UConn alumni can do to support Native faculty and students on campus? Chris, you want to get launch us on that? I wish we had some students here because I know they the lovely. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah no, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll jump in with some of Sage's words here because I've, I've gotten the chance to see her speak many times because this really speaks to my experience as well. Um, you know, as a Native student on campus, um, oftentimes you are the only Native in your class. Say if you're taking a U.S. history class and the stuff, you know, Native content comes up, then you become the spokesman for all of Native America uh, when you are in that class. That happens to Sage as a student right now on the UConn campus. Um, that experience needs to change, right? And so, uh, you know, recruitment of Native students uh, needs to increase, especially in-state recruitment. 
uh, recognition of the land grant status, uh, you know, and, and the, the history of how, um, you know, uh, certain populations have benefited from that, but yet the native populations, five recognized tribes within the state of Connecticut, don't benefit from it whatsoever. I don't even know of any Pequots um, in, in my own community uh, that have Yukon degrees. Most of them go to other institutions, so they're not even attracted to go to the campus here. Uh, that needs to change. And so if we look at other institutions, some of them are actually actively starting to do things. And, and one example is in my uh, um, home territory, the University of Maine, um, a long, uh, several years back, um, they uh, recognized their constitutional obligation. Uh, it's written within one of the articles, uh, you know, for educational um, uh, responsibilities for uh, native populations that they absorbed from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts when they became a state. And so the University of Maine began to offer tuition free uh, um, uh, education at uh, on the state school level and then many of the other state schools uh, not not land grant institutions but some of the private institutions also started to offer that um, some of that got rescinded but a uh, new Maine still kept and held on to it and they actually expanded it now to you don't have to be a native from the state of Maine you can be uh, a native from the United States uh, you can apply to the University of Maine and go there tuition free um, so that's an example of a, a school that has a large native faculty, a very strong native faculty in a state which has a very strong native presence, right? Active, you know, actively making a difference um, for the native population. But we're talking about, you know, a couple of hundred years of not doing anything before we finally got to that point. These are very recent developments with the University of Maine. UConn can follow that example. The University of Minnesota is another one that is offering tuition free for in-state native students um, as a way of once again going after the inequities of uh, you know that have been created by the existence of the school itself, um, and so I advocate strongly uh, that UConn should be offering tuition-free assistance for at least the five second state-recognized tribe. But I would hope that they, they would recognize that Connecticut is really the river and not the, the colonial border that we've drawn out, um, and that Native peoples are all affected by this entire system here, and that they would invite their sister tribes that are located in, in the general area as well. Thanks for that, Chris. Um, I would just add add to that, you know, so some specific things I know that they're working on and if there's any alums listening in, whatever, you know, you can do to support and, um, uh, and you know, be in contact with people at the university now about your support is the signage project, you know, and what would that, so, being, being that the East Coast was sort of ground zero, right, for um, uh, for the expansion, whatever, however you want to call the project, um, invasion, expansion, uh, settlement, um, you know, within this area, within this territory, indigenous erasure is so profound, um, sort of the ways in which indigenous peoples are invisibilized. So many times in New England, you'll, you know, I think, when I'm here the most is, um, or being here, it's more common for me to hear like, oh, we didn't even know that there was still Native peoples alive. So the erasure is pretty profound because of that history. So anything that creates a kind of visibility in the way that they're imagining the signage project, um, um, I think is helpful. Um, the other thing near and dear to their heart, I think is, um, again, currently they're the Native American Cultural Program. They're not a formally recognized student group like the other student groups. Um, and they've been advocating for that status for a very long time. Um, and and in, in part of um, gaining that status would be also gaining a full-time um, advisor and staff person. Right now it's like a part-time um, graduate student who's doing an amazing job. Um, but again, you know, imagine being a grad student trying to do everything you need to do, and then also sort of carrying the labor of, 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 of trying to manage and to be supportive in a, in a cultural program and students. Um, and then I would, I would make a plug for hiring more Native and Indigenous faculty. Um, you know, there's a full-time and tenure track, you know, two's a good start, but we should be, there should be many, many more. And I would totally um, support Chris's notion um, or the idea that lots of universities often uh, free tuition for the, um, certainly for the peoples 
on whose territory they are, but sometimes beyond. There was a faculty member at Colby College in a long time ago, 1997, 98, around that time. Um, and the students there brought it to, to the president at that time. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, the response at that time was like, well, we, we sort of do offer free tuition because of, you know, if somebody uh, applied to Kobe, you know, from either the Passamaquoddy or Penobscot Res, you know, they're, you know, they'd have to fill out financial aid. And after all that, it would certainly come out that they would um, not pay tuition at Kobe, which was tremendous, which is tremendous. Um, but, you know, that, that's such a different um, way, like if a family imagines that it's outside of their, you know, outside of possibility for them, it's one thing to say, well, no, you can fill out this form and then you can do this and then you do, we'll do that. And then we'll have this, instead of just saying, um, you know, because of a way of reckoning of the history and that we remain on this land. Um, and, and often land of different peoples is held in trust. So there is supposed to be, um, uh, you know, sort of a, a continued supported financial support as a as a um, as a as a component of many treaties to support education and health and welfare, um, and it often doesn't happen. That was the Cobell lawsuit uh, many years ago. Is somebody actually Eloise Obe Cobell was like, "I want accounting. You've been holding our land and trust for hundreds of years, and we haven't seen anything. We're the poorest reservation in the U.S. right now." So she demanded an accounting. Um, and that if you ever wanna follow a uh, meandering history of uh, Native people's relation to the settler state, uh, look up the Cobell, <laughs> the Cobell um, uh, legislation. Um, so it's a very different, I think, way to message um, and to actually reckon with the history to say, uh, you know, because of where we are and the history um, behind the formation of the institution, um, at minimal native peoples of this land um, will be able to come and get a free education. And then to Luisa's point, we have to be ready for those students. I, I also think if uh, I- Oh, go ahead, sorry. If I can say that like specifically, uh, Yukon with the Yukon Gives campaign uh, as uh, donations from alumni, and there is an alumni representative, I think, I don't know if it's in the board of trustees of a particular council. But anyways, I received the letter to vote for a person to represent me as an alumni there. And I think like, if you're a person for your alumni that is engaged with, with UConn in some way still, and you, part you either donate or participate in any of these campaigns, I think you definitely have the power to say, well, like they say before, call your representative. Like you can directly ask, what are you doing for Native American students? There is this project that came out. What are you doing about it to recognize? What is the Native American Cultural Center? What they don't have this person supporting it then? I want my donation to go towards them. If you ask for that specifically also, it's like, because you have the money, you can, you have a say in that. So I think it be more intentional and uh, outspoken with the direct support that you want and we all want for the Native American students. So if you have the money in your pocket, ask where it should go, Native American students. Weird, I don't know if you wanna jump in or if we wanna take another question. Yeah, I think just on the topic of kind of resources in general, um, we're really lucky at Greenhouse Studios to have like a great group of people that wanted to work on this and that were able to work on this um, because of the funding that we have. but. I know that that's not possible for a lot of people to, to be able to do this. Um, I know we had to ask ourselves a couple of times like, if we were the right people to do this. So I think just in general, um, I think it's just worth thinking about where resources are going in academia because the I mean just the response we've gotten from this in general has been very positive. There's a lot of people that would like to be working on stuff like this. They just, like, like we're saying, they don't have the time because of other responsibilities or they don't have the resources just because they're not given the resources. So I, I just think that um, as we're kind of thinking about this more holistically, I think we need to think about it as a university, kind of where our resources are going and what kind of research we want to be doing, um, just kind of more generally as well. Thanks for that, Kim. Thank you all. Um, I really appreciate all of your insights.
I am going to go to our next question. Um, so UConn has a history of campus traditions, um, and this individual would love to know if you all have any suggestions for how these traditions can be taught while also being respectful of an indigenous history. For example, balancing the history of Charles and Augustus Storrs, gifting the land that would become Yukon, et cetera. Um, Could you repeat that one more time? Sorry, I don't think I caught that. Sure, I'm happy to repeat. So UConn has a history of campus traditions. Do you all have any recommendations or suggestions for how these traditions can be taught um, you know, we often like when students become uh, matriculate at UConn, they're taught about some of the campus traditions. They're sort of for some people ingrained in their alumni experience. Um, so how can we be respectful of indigenous history while still honoring some of these traditions? Um, like, I don't understand specifically what this person refers to campus traditions. Maybe I understand that it's made celebrating the gifting of the land by Charles and Agus stores. Um, I mean, and you can certainly celebrate that they recognize the need for some land for these students, for the university. But I also think this uh, you should look at what happened before they got the land and how they got the land, which is which is also a very problematic history um, that involved wind dam. It, it, it's very complicated. So. And I also think that we cannot be um, we cannot be afraid of challenging certain traditions. We need to look at how they are formed, what do they celebrate, what is the story behind, and how they affect other people than us. And welcome uh, the feeling of feeling uncomfortable, uh, like oh my god, I'm celebrating this, I'm going to miss celebrating this. But it turns out that it might not be a great thing to celebrate. Um, and in this, I refer to a really good historians that have a book titled Invented Traditions. Sometimes we think like traditions are thousands of years old. This was just invented 20 years ago. Some of these things, you know, they are not that old. They are not natural to us. So I think like challenging traditions is a good way to be a decent human being today. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and on the uh, college traditions, I, you know, I went to Dartmouth College and there were still um, several problematic traditions, right, uh, of the college. They had what, uh, the, 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 during senior week, they had a tradition that they called the clay pipe ceremony, where they would light clay pipes and reminiscent of the Dartmouth's Indian heritage or supposed Indian heritage, um, clay pipes being the, the type of pipes used by the tribes in the area. Uh, they would smoke from them and then they would go up to this uh, tree stump, which uh, uh, a former tree stood, you know, and uh, break them as a sign of breaking away from the college, right? That was the tradition that was created. Um, you know, as Native students, we looked at this and said, you know, they're using tobacco, they're using, they're really borrowing from this, this whole you know, fantasy that was created, that Dartmouth was created for Indians, um, you know, and, uh, you know, perpetuating this myth. And that's what the students leave with. That's their lasting impression is that I went to this enlightened place that is so uh, Indian friendly um, that I engaged in a ceremony that, you know, uh, involved Native American culture when in fact it did not. And so challenging a tradition like that, which had been around for well over 85 years, met with resistance. But that's what happens with traditions is, uh, as Lisa was saying, oftentimes people feel like they, they've been around for thousands of years. But when it comes to college traditions, oftentimes they've been around less than 100, probably only a couple of decades. Um, and we can come up with new traditions. Uh, and I'll give you a great example. Some of the work that Agamo Educational Ed Initiative has done at Con Connecticut College, um, one of the things we did was we worked with them on um, the, the freshman orientation uh, to have uh, Pequots and Mohegans present. Uh, teaching about their presence uh, and the fact that the college exists on uh, Pequot Mohegan land. They also have a tradition of their own where they have uh, at their uh, graduation commencement, they put out a flag uh, for every, um, you know, every country that a student has come from. Uh, there's a flag representing all of those countries and, and uh, they've never had a Mohegan 
or Pequot graduate yet, but in honor of the fact that they are existing on Mohegan Pequot land, they now fly uh, the Eastern Pequot, the Mohegan Pequot, and the Mohegan flag um, as part of that flag um, uh, 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 display uh, for their commencement. And so these are new traditions, right? That are kind of you know it, it, uh, you know reforming the tra the traditions that they had, um, but you know being inclusive uh, uh, in, in the way that they did it. And so there are ways to do that and uh, challenging them is oftentimes the first thing. Uh, but you know, when you do meet resistance, just you know, remind ourselves of our humanity uh, and our, our, our collective responsibility to one another, especially in a diverse place like a college university. I love those responses. Thank you. And I'll just add that um, you know, there's traditions and then there's traditions. Some are about beneficence beneficence and I, I just got to UConn so I don't know the traditions but if it's about you know the family that um, you know gave the land I think in an act of beneficence um, you know history is complicated which is what makes these current bills you know so um, I mean wrong-headed in my opinion um, because history is complicated and you know this kind of brings me back to the issue of language as well the notion of tension or complication or um, is embedded in, in, in our language, in the Quechua language, there's this notion of, of chi'i as an example, which is nothing, nothing exists without being in tension with something else. And so um, you understand that, which is, you know, maybe in the English language, there's this, again, embedded logic, as Garrett talked about it, of removal. Like you can't, if you, if you have this thing, you can't have this other thing without removing the thing before, a removal, erasure, removal, erasure, replacement. Um, and that, you know, that's to some degree embedded maybe in, if not the language, then the logics. Um, when really, I think if we could all learn to sort of embrace the notion that things are in tension, that things are complicated. Um, and it's in that productive tension that we, you know, maybe we're learning um, resides, would we all be better off. I think we can learn from the projects of lots of institutions like Georgetown and Brown that launched tremendous projects about the history of the institution's complicity with um, uh, slavery and the ways in which their institutions were built through um, slavery and enslavement of, of black peoples. Um, and, and, you know, I think it's time and, and some institutions are already doing it. We should, we should be in the front end of it as well of, of launching such large um, reckoning projects. Um, where we all sort of um, acknowledge and attend to the complications of history and traditions. But I agree with Lisa, some just need to go. I don't know what they are, but you know, people get into this um, kind of, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know what it is, but it reminds me of sort of mas masketry is a big issue in Connecticut right now. Some traditions are just violent and they, and they don't need to persist. Thank you all. Um, so our next question is around um, land acknowledgements. I'm going to broaden it a little bit just because the individual's question was fairly specific. Um, so for organizations based in Connecticut that would like to develop a land acknowledgement um, that can be read at events like this or displayed uh, within the organization, do you have a recommendation for how they could proceed with developing that or any resources that uh, we can direct them to? But I would say higher agama, but I'm going to let Chris take this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, uh, that, that's, a, that's a common request that, that we, and, and we did work with the University of Connecticut in development of uh, uh, Yukon's. Uh, actually, it wasn't Yukon's land acknowledgement. It was really the, the Dodd Human Rights Center land acknowledgement and the New York School of Education land acknowledgement. And then it was later adopted, um, you know, by uh, the rest of the university, the university president. Um, you know, one of the things that I would recommend is that uh, you don't hire somebody to write it for you. You know, that's one of the things that uh, there's a process. Uh, there, there, there's something to the process of you as an institution going through and learning this history yourself and writing those words down on paper yourself, you know, acknowledging these things for yourself. Um, but, you know, there are groups like Agamal Educational Initiative that can help to shape it and also to bridge the connection between Native communities so that you can have that involvement, that equitable relationship with the communities 
in the development of the language to make sure that you know it is all it is inclusive of the groups that you want to be inclusive of. And as Sandy said, these are living documents when it comes to land acknowledgement. They should not be you know kind of stuck in stone. Um, they can be uh, you know somewhat fluid, especially uh, depending on the context. Um, you know, so th those are some of the recommendations. Uh, resources. There are several really good articles, but uh, I'm gonna um, plug my my uh, business partner and good friend and Donna Spears from Agama Educational Initiative. Um, she's also on the council, uh, the, the National Council for uh, State uh, uh, National Federation for State Humanities Councils, and she did a great interview on land acknowledgments. And if you Google and Donna Spears, E N D A W N I S Spears uh, and um, uh, land acknowledgments, that interview will come up, and that is a terrific resource. Um, you know, for for just thinking about what land acknowledgments do, the process, what they do, and what they don't do, um, and, which is also an important thing to consider. I have a question there, following up with the question of the person. So, among the things that they don't do, is there the fact that they don't address the violence of the dispossession? Because I, I think the question also covers that, right? We are putting the land acknowledgement, but we are not, we recognize that the land belongs to these people, but there is not a word there that suggests that this was a violent process. So um, I have just this question in myself, is this a conscious decision in trying not to like to create bridges with the community and not include those type of words, or is it something that we should consider? Well, the whole, the whole history of them is, is you know, also complicated. I put um, also a link in the chat of a, also another excellent resource and video from uh, Dr. Kutcher Rising um, Baldi, who's at Humboldt State University on what makes a good land acknowledgement. Um, and, you know, the other, you know, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, you know, all were in practice, had land acknowledgements in practice long before they came um, to the U.S. Um, and so the, the history is its own history is complex and complicated. And I think no one acknowledgement looks the same and, and some really do, um, I think, um, speak to the speak to the violence and erasure and elimination. Um, I've seen I've seen lots of different variations of it. Um, um, but yeah, like like other kinds of practices and policies that they can become the domain of sort of a liberal um, politics or a liberal uh, form of governance that that um, you know where where it just becomes something a bit empty. It's always a possibility. Thank you. Um, so uh, I think this next question is probably for Garrett and Louisa. Uh, one of our attendees has asked if we are aware of how much money the um, today's value of the original $3,000 Yukon received or continues to receive as part of the Morrill Act. And maybe if you could also explain sort of the source of this funds uh, that the university receives in perpetuity. So this $3,000 is our $3,000 the university receives today mm -hmm. from the endowment of, of those cells. So they gathered the money during those times, they put it into an account and that money is still there. They cannot touch it, but it gives you like interest. And that is the $3,000 that we received today. Um, as Garrett said, it doesn't seem like a lot, but when you look at the number of land, and that's what I said, it's like, let's, let's do, do not fall into the, the, the practice of wanting to, like we belong to a capitalist culture that wants to quantify everything in numbers, right? And yeah, it is possible to try to, to quantify to, to certain level uh, certain things. But in the case of the dispossession of the land, it's very difficult to do that because there are a lot of factors and also because you are actively the, like taking the, the is attempting cultural genocide. And the other thing is that at the point, uh, as Gary mentioned, like the University of Connecticut actually engaged in a legal battle with uh, Yale University over the status of land grant university so they could receive the money. And why? Because UConn at the University of Connecticut, which it wasn't the name at that point, wasn't profitable. It wasn't making money. 
it wasn't drawing that many students. So they definitely needed the money and the money arrived in a moment in which it allows the universities to continue. So it doesn't matter how little it was. If you don't have any money at a certain point, anything little, $1,000 is gonna help you stay on your feet. And that's what happened with the Montreal Act uh, and Yukon University. It allows it to stay and to become the university that it is today. Yeah, yeah. Just kind of, kind of to add to that, um, you can, or the state of Connecticut is not very good for agriculture. I don't know if people know that or not. So it was this fight over the money was more. I mean, it was it was partially this i this ideological fight between like a liberal education or like a classical education and then this agricultural or mechanical education. But it was really, like I said before, it was it was a fight over the money first of all. But it's also the state has a certain relationship with land grant institutions that. Um, sort of like once once these institutions are established, the state is a, or state funds them. It keeps them going. They have a, a reciprocal relationship where the state feeds money into the land grant institution. Uh, the land grant institution then um, educates citizens to to like boost economic output, um, and then they kind of have like this this relationship with each other. So um, after after the original Moral Act, there was a second Moral Act passed. It there was even more money that was granted to land grant institutions. Um, after that, there was the Hatch Act that was passed. There was even more money that was given to land grant institutions. And then, because uh, UConn is a land grant institution, it also um, there's a number of different um, million dollar and billion dollar uh, grants from the state that it's gotten over the last 100 years or so. So it's it's it kind of goes beyond just like whatever the original amount of money is. It's it's uh, capitalism has a way of like once it makes something real, it it likes to sustain that thing. So. Once it makes the land grant system re or the land grant institution real, it, it likes to sustain that thing, and it kind of keeps the original idea of this original idea of like this is an agricultural institution, even if that's not been the case throughout its history. It still keeps that ideal of agriculture and working the land and this sort of like old school American like get your hands dirty sort of thing, even if it's not um, what it is currently. Even though like it, it still does have an agricultural program now. So I mean, like I said, it, it's it is the original money, and we don't. We actually don't have somebody that's able or it's, it's beyond our capacities to figure out how much money that is. I'm sure somebody could do it, but we don't have an accountant or a business person or somebody who's good with interest. Um, I'm sure somebody could figure out how much the $3,000 has meant over the last couple hundred years or something. But um, I, it's one of those things that maybe the numbers, like Louise is saying, don't actually, I mean, they do matter, obviously, but maybe they don't matter as much as, as, uh, as it might seem at first. Well, as we're coming up on close to the end, I'm going to knit some of the things um, together. And Garrett, I really appreciate um, the kind of notion of compounding interest. Um, so to kind of knit some of the things that have been raised together, you know, we talked about affirmative action, we talked about issues of access, we talked about, you know, dollar amounts and, and what it, you know, traditions, you know, and the kind of misperception people have of how long things have um, existed. And up until maybe the 1970s, college education for those who had access, which is still primarily elite, not even really working class whites and certainly not students of color, um, you know, was for all intents and purposes, sometimes outright free or, or certainly very affordable, right? And once there was broader access, we saw a tremendous increase in tuition. Um, and then sort of, fat, and that's just, we're, again, we're talking since the 1970s, roughly, in terms of, of the history of higher education. Fast forward a little bit, I did do an accounting um, for, for another purpose fairly recently, but um, in the pandemic, many of the, you know, sort of first institutions of the country, Harvard, Yale, Columbia, et cetera, Dartmouth, um, have all posted tremendous gains to their endowments, right? like, men, that, like the elite and rich in general. So Yale, which Connecticut has its own sort of ties historically, um, posted a $276 million surplus, which added to their now like 31 point something billion dollar endowment. The Bureau of Indian Education, which was established to support higher gen post-secondary education for native students in the US, primarily through land held in trust. Um, the entire budget was $98 million in 2020. So put differently, Yale's current endowment could fund every single tribal college and technical school for Native students for the next 318 years. So 
I think what, what often gets erased is just the tremendous disparity. Um, and what, when we're talking about inequalities, what we're really talking about. So we're at time, I don't want this to end without um, thanking again, all our sponsors, thanking the panelists, all of you contributions to this conversation, um, people for um, writing your wonderful questions into the chat to Abigail, Alyssa, and April for really having the vision for this event, for understanding that in this series of, you know, about America that um, really just creating the space for us. Um, I can't say how much I appreciate your framing of the event, the way that you invited us into the space. Uh, very, very grateful for that. Um, and then just to say, particularly in this moment when the nation's highest leaders are calling into question who counts as American still, right, in 2020. I appreciate the space, this conversation. Indigenous peoples precede the nation state. We continue to be citizens of our own nations. We are the pre-existing condition and the architects of democracy and the stewards of this land. We persist in relation to what is now the US and we are not just a part of Yukon's past, but I know that we all look forward to being a critical aspect of its future. So thank you so much for joining us tonight.